Hi, I'm Craig Smith, a former New York Times correspondent and host of the podcast Eye on AI. I'm also a special government employee at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And in this role, I'm serving as the host for NSC AI's podcast series on the Commission's work. This is the fourth episode of six, looking at the Commission's second quarter recommendations to Congress. In the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, the Congress established the National Security Commission on AI to consider the methods and means necessary to integrate artificial intelligence into the national security and defense needs of the United States. This week, I speak with Katerina McFarlane, an NSC AI commissioner, about her line of efforts recommendations on inserting AI into the national defense strategy and how war games could integrate AI-enabled applications in order to inform U.S. military doctrine. I hope you find the conversation as interesting as I did. Katerina, could you begin by giving a brief introduction of yourself and your role on the commission, and then we'll start with a question. That sounds great, Craig. My background is over 30 years as a professional engineer, program manager, and in the acquisition system as a civilian servant. Then I became, under the previous administration, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and also the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology. And from there, when I was asked to serve on the commission, and I'm very pleased to do so, there's so much going on. Your line of effort in the second quarter recommendations opens with a definition of algorithmic warfare, which I found very interesting. The idea that the future of war will pit algorithms against algorithms in a contest dominated more by speed and accuracy than by traditional military factors. Does the commission believe that conventional armed conflict, in other words, boots on the ground, will eventually disappear? Well, I'd like to stress the idea that algorithmic warfare within the context of national security would have a profound effect on all elements of our national power. It will affect definitely military competition, which we will have focused in more on this line of effort, but it will also impact our economic power, our diplomatic power, and how we leverage information for traditional soft power. We need to get AI right for the sake of our national security and economic prosperity. It crosses all domains. The stakes of this technological revolution are immense. How we adopt AI will have profound ramifications on our economic well-being and position in the world. With that said, within the military context, the integration of AI-enabled technology throughout military systems and operations will increase the accuracy and speed of perceiving understanding, deciding, and acting well beyond the capacity and capability of human cognition alone. Conventional armed conflict will not disappear to your specific question. However, we recognize that tactical, operational, and strategic implications enabled through AI will be throughout our military systems, processes, and operations. It's important to put that in the context of our strategic competitors. The Chinese and Russian government want to use AI-enabled autonomous systems and AI in their military strategies, operations, and their capabilities to undermine our superiority. AI in that vein would enter into a new era of algorithmic warfare that envisions the real possibility of our adversaries who don't have our ethical values conducting combat operations with these intelligent systems, weapons, equipment, platforms, with AI as the core. Even if conventional armed conflict doesn't go away, it exposes soldiers on the ground and in mechanized units or aircraft to a new level of threat. The commission makes the point that the defense establishment needs to move at the speed of relevance, which I thought was an interesting way to put it, again, referencing speed. Is it possible, given the various levels of control over safety and security and the simple bureaucratic inertia that the governments battle, for the defense capabilities to keep pace with relevant technologies? 
And already the defense establishment is years behind the private sector. You're right. But let's make sure we look at speed and relevance in the context that we're trying to promote. Speed for the sake of speed hasn't value. Speed for the sake of being relevant and providing for overmatch is of merit. So relevance doesn't have to necessarily be exactly comparable to all of the advances that are out there for AI. They have to be pertinent to the military strength and power, and in particular, be able to overmatch against our adversaries. So we want to think of relevance in that term, speed unto itself again, no value. But our nation's facing a new area of power competition, and it's essential for our military and intelligence community to have the ability to stay ahead. And those new technologies bring to the fight an unprecedented need for this agility and speed, again, in the context of relevancy. A large bureaucracy or an organization is challenging, especially when new technologies are involved. As our interim report stated, the government strategies to recognize the importance such as AI as an emerging technology or an enabling technology is struggling to effectively drive that implementation. It's not a plane, train, or automobile. It's an enabler. It's everywhere. It's omnipresent. It's hard to say, I'd like to prioritize AI today. How do you do that is where we come in. You recommend that the DOD produce a classified technology annex to the National Defense Strategy, outlining clear plans for pursuing disruptive technologies and applications. In other words, staying relevant and charting a clear course for fielding critical emerging technologies. I was just curious, why cast that as an annex? You tied these two questions together well, because in the world of commercial, industry, they've long recognized the advantage that comes from iterating, upgrading, and deploying smart algorithms faster than the competition and the government having lagged behind is exactly why we recommend the creation of this classified annex. The national defense strategy is the Department of Defense's highest strategic document. We want to set AI into that, and that allows the department to set a direction to implement how to achieve and be posture to achieve the U.S. national defense strategy. The creation of a classified annex to the national defense strategy that outlines a clear plan to pursue technologies and applications that address the operational challenges that are identified in the national defense strategy would advance our implementation by connecting our strategic vision to priority investments. The national defense strategy has a huge bottoms-up, top-down process that focuses on trying to understand and account for global technology trends, understanding where and what are the will for a threat to be applied against us, and it allows for the appropriate, most important, prioritization of investment against risk and reward that is balanced. When we think of the National Defense Strategy, we think of where we have a strategic plan to protect our nation's values, our nation's ability to conduct its commerce, all of the things that we value and aspire as a free nation, the National Defense Strategy's goal is to protect that. A technology annex would be led by the DOD with the support of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. It would chart a clear course to identify, develop, field, sustain all these critical emerging and enabling technologies and for speeding up their transition into capabilities, because it would have the force of everyone's understanding behind it. All of the entities that build it would know their part in doing that resourcing and fielding and essentially the iteration of those technologies. Since the National Defense Strategy is a living document, that would allow it for a constant update to be reviewed iteratively and annually to make sure that it's moving forward with the rapidly changing world of technologies as we know it. Yeah. And so that would insert AI technology into the top line strategic vision. And then all of these other recommendations that the commission is making on fielding digital workforce or improving technological diplomacy or building data repositories or things like that would be implementations that would support 
that strategic vision. Is that right? Yeah, it'll be tied to understanding the threat. One of our biggest challenges always has been adequate resources against what we can see as the terrain. When you want a resource, you want to make it against those things that will bring you trading against risk and reward, the biggest reward against the threat or the adversary or the situation that you live in. When you have the intelligence information provided to you and you can trade it against the art of the industry's ability to achieve and where and what we have for our military strength and strength being all of the attributes, people, etc. These are the types of details that go into creation of a national defense strategy that allows us to make those trades that everybody can sign up to. The commission recommends that the annex be prepared by the tri-chair committee that was proposed in the first quarter recommendations, chaired by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, and that the annex should be prepared by January 2021. That just seems like a possibly unrealistic timeline, given that the tri-chair steering committee is still but an idea. Do you have a sense of the timeline for whether or not the tri-chair committee will be stood up and how much time it would take for that committee then to rule on the annex? From my own experience in the department from 9-11, when we have a calling of this magnitude, this department can respond. And changing an organizational structure to provide this oversight by aligning the deputy secretary of defense, the vice chairman, a joint chief of staff, and having ODNI at the table, we can move a lot. A lot of work has been done already in the department. We have very evident areas that we could move out on quickly. They may not answer all of them, but to move forward is the first step to going towards success. For a couple reasons, our strategic competitors obviously having an integrated strategic plan that they've demonstrated adherence and unprecedented success on implementing on a very aggressive timeline indicates we don't have the luxury of time. Unlike technologies of the past, you know, our strategic advantage will not go to the country that develops the novel applications of AI for the national security. It'll go to the country that adopts them first. We have a great track record of developing, but we have a lousy track record of adopting. Our adversaries have actually been quicker at adopting than we have. So I think really drafting this National Defense Technology Annex can be an iterative process that starts at hitting at the quickest and most evident areas where we can improve and we've identified some of them. We'll start us on the path to understanding the adoption of AI. We can provide through a steering committee the most appropriate form to manage that annex because it includes the senior leaders that would be able to drive action and oversee processes with technical expertise at the table. On the thought that adversaries have a plan in place and they're moving very aggressively out on, of course, we're talking about China, how much visibility does the commission have into what China has done or its processes and its implementations? I don't say China. I say the People's Liberation Army and the People's Republic and the same thing for the Russian government. They have been very, very articulate in their military civilian integration, broadcasting their plans for how they would adopt and change their country's situation to be in control of the global commons and the ability to be a leading factor. Those things are in our public domain. So it's not like they haven't been warned. (laughs) One of the things that we call bureaucratic, for example, things that we do to ensure that software does what it's intended and doesn't do something else, is not necessarily adopted by our adversaries. Many of our risk-associated profiles are done because we've had mistakes, and others don't necessarily and haven't necessarily had that same learning. We're going to have to adopt some changes to do this, but I believe we're able to, which is encouraging. China has the advantage of pairing this with a very aggressive and well-funded soft power initiative through the Belt and Road Initiative and the Digital Silk Road and programs like that. The U.S. seems to have retreated from some of those really bold economic outreach initiatives. 
But on the other hand, the U.S. benefits from a network of allies with shared values, whereas China kind of stands alone. It doesn't have a network of people who either share Chinese culture in the way that the West shares Western culture, and it doesn't have value-based allies in the way that the U.S. does in Europe and other places in the world. Is that balance between throwing money abroad and relying on shared values something that the commission talks about or is concerned about? I think pretty much all of the dimensions of the conversation have been shared amongst our committee and commission members. All of the policies, from political policies to the initiatives for technology that are being demonstrated by the People's Liberation Army and the PRC writ large, are geared towards ascending to become a global power. The commission is concerned about it. Each of us have our own underlying thoughts about it. But the way the commission has approached this is essentially to look at the trends, the progress, and we have put into place recommendations to close that gap. The report gives a very cogent explanation for how AI determines military doctrine or can determine military doctrine. And I thought it was worth repeating some of it for listeners, so I won't read the entire thing. But it says that successful militaries develop doctrine through rigorous experimentation of potential warfighting concepts to address specific military challenges. And then it gives the example, Germany's idea that a mechanized force could break through defenses more quickly than the defending force could reinforce or counterattack, provided a potential solution to the stalemate of trench warfare. And that was prototyped and tested through war games and military exercises until it was codified as Blitzkrieg and then became a doctrine that was used to organize, train, and equip the German military for combat. So integrating AI into concept development is a critical step, both in bringing AI capabilities into use and in enabling next-generation military concepts and doctrine. Can you comment or expand on that? A lot of people don't understand how military doctrine is formed, and here we have a new technology, and you really need to play with it, to test it, implement it at different levels, whether it's tabletop or ring exercises or using the technology in actual combat situations. But you need that information in order to generate doctrine. I thought that was interesting. That was one of the things as a civilian entering into the workforce for the Department of Defense that was the most important thing to learn, which is how to marry what the military needs to be able to do to train, man, and equip its forces to create effects-based outcomes. And what does that translate into in terms of concepts, ways of fighting? Once you learn that, then you can introduce technologies and capabilities and options for use of application to combat. America is really a place where our military has to reassess its doctrine because these emerging and enabling technologies like AR are impacting both us as being attacked by them and by our ability to utilize AI to protect against them, defend and combat them. When we think of doctrine, it's developed when you think of ways of war fighting. It looks at how you could fight using these technologies, using how we organize, how do we train, how do we move. We call it war gaming, experimentation. We try things out. And I can tell you many times when we handed a piece of gear to somebody, they found a better or different use for it. It's kind of like the screwdriver was intended to drive a screw in the wall, but how many times have you used it to lever something? Doctrine says I adapt. Doctrine says I maximize my use. I look at everything around me. I apply it in the best form. So I protect myself and gain my objective the quickest with the least bloodshed. So we're looking at how do operators, commanders, analysts understand these technologies because we haven't adapted them. We have no doctrine for AI. And so hands-on is the way you approach the testing of these concepts and these technologies. 
We use, like I said, war games, exercise. We field prototypes. You build it a certain way. You test it out. You find out why you're testing it. If you had moved the lever to the right or if you had done a different design, it would be more effective. When we think about doctrine, we think about how to create the science in terms of all of the organized, resource, train, equip, including sustaining and disposal. What is it that we need to do to change the way we fight that can best adapt to AI? You make the point that existing war games should integrate AI-enabled applications in order to inform doctrine. Can you talk about some of the early applications that might be integrated sooner than later? We've avoided specific identification of technologies. We give general ones because we think that by design, The first thing is for the DOD to create this technological annex. We don't want to be presumptive, but we can definitely talk around what we can see as things to be steps on an incline, things that could be taken on to improve. We're talking about things that are relieving cognitive burden. So I'm going to talk through attributes so that when technologies are chosen, you can think of them in the terms of an attribute. We want to remove cognitive burden so that humans can make better informed decisions or act more quickly in a complex situation. We want them not to be focused on redundant and repetitive tasks. We want them to be what we are that is a differentiation between us and computers as an example, where we can connect things not limited by time and very quickly through experiential knowledge and make decisions. For example, like intelligence, tactical, and operational planning support systems automating large portions of the joint operations planning and execution system and other things like the military decision-making process to generate courses of actions and planning. If I've got to do sorties for an aircraft, I have a mission planning system that knows how ready my aviator is, what the plane is and how many hours on it. If we had that automated and not done by humans, we could regenerate forces, we could provide for readiness. It's essentially removing the lesser tasks that are repetitive and math intensive or under stress, but computers repeatedly do well in. Those are the type of places that we could do an improvement. Think logistics, paying people, predictive analytics, contingency planning, those things. And you recommend that DOD should incentivize experimentation with AI through the Warfighting Lab Innovation Fund. I keep learning about things in the government I'd never heard of. That was established in 2016. Can you explain what that fund does, how it gets funded, and how large it is? The Warfighting Lab Innovation Fund was established expressly to support development and refinement of new service and joint concepts of operation. It was used to spur field experiments and demonstrations that would evaluate, analyze, and provide insight into more effective ways of using our current capabilities and identify new ways of incorporating technologies into future operations and organizations with the changing of the ability to do processing of decisions and burdens. The structure of how we're organized ties to decision making, and we can realign things. They're funded out of operations and maintenance funds appropriately because that is where the business is. It's an operational activity. Broader details on the funding I can't provide because they're mostly classified, but What we recommended was that DOD should either develop a special category to focus on the funding of any qualified entry who wants to incorporate AI applications into existent exercises or games or to incorporate AI applications as one of the prioritized evaluation criteria. So this is where we're saying, hey, you've got an experimentation lab going out there. It's with service and joint. You need to raise up your gain, taking a look at maybe the national defense strategies, prioritized efforts, and get these technologies into the hands of warfighters and users to try to accelerate lab to field transition, get it moving forward. I'm not looking for an absolute number. I just wanted a sense, is it transformational, the size of that fund that it can really stand up a technology, or is it incremental? It's substantive because it is warfighting. No warfighting game is cheap. It brings in our allies. It looks at how would we want to do global operations to local operations.
Beyond warfighting, you recommend that the DOD develop a prioritized list of core administrative functions that can be performed with robotic process automation and AI-enabled analysis. What sorts of functions are you talking about? In the commercial world, you'll find that many of these are actually procured from people who do it professionally. For example, there are people who do payroll. You just pay a fee. And what they have is a robotic system that automates the process. So things like budget and finance, logistics, human resources, retail, real estate, healthcare, they're on the enterprise level scale that you could prioritize for robotic process automation and AI enable analysis. These are areas where the employment of AI would allow us to modernize the business function across the DOD and integrating its function across the life cycle to understand relationships. We have a real need to get to big data and understanding where data is that could help us be more efficient. And just thinking audit function alone. Getting people out of the repetitive data entry and box checking roles, letting them focus on high value added roles such as client relationships, strategic formulation, or where we want them to be, similar to what we're talking about for warfighting functions. Get them out of the burden of a cognitive load that isn't moving forward, but is repetitive. Integrating those functions across that life cycle starts us getting data pools, documenting our business functions, cradle to grave, talking and seeing and learning from what we're doing and obviously being in the procurement and acquisition role, contracting, how is it doing well and how is it not? From announcements to bids, where can we improve And that'll give us resources, especially as we know we're going into areas and have historically gone up and down in resource availability. When we have to tighten our belts, how do we get more out of our money? There has got to be an initiative across the U.S. government to do this that would cover the DOD. Or are you basically saying it's not happening and the DOD should just take the bull by the horns and do it for itself, and maybe other departments or other agencies will follow along. They're doing some. I just think we could do a lot more. We can improve these functions. We could definitely modernize how we get our people out of the repetitive processes and into more high-value analytics and roles for strategic thinking rather than doing data entry. Are you aware of a government-wide initiative that this may fit into? Presumably, you would want the entire government to be working on the same auditing software, the entire government, including DOD, working on the same data entry software. That would be an absolute value add. The government is the largest business that we have. And so it's going to be a real challenge to try to pull down through what is considered prior investment, sunken costs. Is it something that you can transform in increments or can you actually replace overnight? That is a cost dynamic that needs to be pulled forward and understood. One would think that you could achieve that. Following on that, talk about using commercial AI software to do things like manage and label data, deploy models, and also to audit accounts or handle bookkeeping. For listeners in the private sector, how does a startup approach the DOD with solutions that would address this digital transformation? A lot of startups I talk to are frustrated. They say it's controlled by the prime integrators. Is there a role for individual companies to work directly with the DOD? And if so, how do they do so? Yes, there is. There are increasingly more venues to try to bring in from the private sector startups and innovative solution components to the table. Historically, the primary avenue for commercial enders was to market their products to the GSA, the General Services Administration. If you go to their website, you'd find a detailed listing of the products on their schedule to solicit. But it requires a commitment of time and resources that many of these startups can't support. So to better access the startup community, the DoD has created a range of these organizations and mechanisms to start partnering with individual companies. 
each of the services has ombudsmen and each of the services have small business personnel and websites, whether it's a lab, whether it's a systems command, whether it's a base or a station, they all have a small business person. In addition to those people who provide venues and mentoring and access to information, each of the armed services, along with the Special Operations Command, stood up and are operating innovative programs like for the SOCOM, Special Operations Command, SoftWorks, and the Air Force, it's AFWorks, and the Navy, it's Navy Super Warfare Centers at Crane's iLight Network, Navalex Tech Bridges Program, all of these you can find in agencies like DARPA, Defense Innovative Unit, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and the Missile Defense Agency, and the Fourth Estate, we call a Fourth Estate of agencies and entities that aren't part of the main services. They all have broad area announcements soliciting new technologies in the private sector. And if you're small, you can actually approach a large and go into what is called a mentorship program, where they actually will work with you to help you. So there's a lot of places. And the leverage for companies that are startups is a very high interest area for the department. Small business innovative research contracts and grants are out there, along with other transaction authorities where you're invited to join a consortium or a group of like area. So let's say there's missiles that people are trying to build. They have a consortium under another transaction authority that you pay very low entry costs. And you sign up and agree to the construct of the OTA and you get an access directly to the government to work with you on new technologies. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Katerina for her time. If you want to learn more about the National Security Commission on AI, visit their website at nscai.gov. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention. <laughs>